Hi everyone and welcome back to the SIP here at Cal Academy. My name is Amy Jo and today we're, we're joined by Haley, who is one of the scientists that makes up the Summer Systematics Institute this year. So Haley, would you mind introducing yourself with your name, your pronouns, your major, as well as your university? Sure, so I'm Haley Schmidt. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I'm here from the University of Texas at San Antonio, where I'm an environmental science major. Great. Oh, and what's what's this in the lower, <laughs> lower <laughs> left? <laughs> I had to represent Texas, so I found <laughs> this meme of a of a bumblebee with a, a cowboy hat. He's saying beehaw, um, <laughs> right underneath my my school's logo. Oh, great! And where are you in in this photo? Is that is that of you, Haley? Yeah, yeah, that's um, at Hill Country State Natural Area. Um, it's uh, a park I got to visit a little while ago. So that's just me showing off, showing off Texas. <laughs> Super, wow, um, great. So do you wanna tell us a little bit about what you're learning this summer? Sure, yeah, so um, this summer I'm working with three different advisors um, across two different departments. Um, I'm working with some folks in botany and in the ornithology and mammalogy department uh, to study how plant community structures have changed post fire, uh, specifically in the Caples Creek watershed, which is in the Sierra Nevada mountains um, across Placerville and El Dorado counties. Um, there was a fire two years ago and the plants have really changed over, over the past couple of years. So we're mm -hmm. checking that out. Okay, nice. Do you have any photos of Caples and, and that yeah, like. yeah, yeah. I think oh, that's. We'll get to that in a second. Here's some pictures from the field. Um, we've got a plant press, which I think I'll probably talk about in a little bit. On the right, and then on the left, we've got some of the scenery there, and and me posing for the picture. <laughs> nice. Okay. And um, is this is this a lake at the top? Yeah, that's um Kirkwood Lake, I believe. Um. We, we didn't just do field work, we got to go and enjoy the land a little bit. <laughs> so that was from our, our off day, we got to go see the lake. It's beautiful out there. Okay, cool. And do you remember like maybe what you were collecting and pressing that day or what's that? Yeah, so we collected um, a, a couple of different things. Um, one of my advisors is really interested in Castilea flowers. So we got to collect a couple for her um, and my favorite one that we collected was called the monument plant, which um, you can see on here. It's kind of, it might be kind of difficult to see, but up on the right side, there's a, a close up picture of it. Um, that was my favorite one that we got to collect. Oh, cool. And what, what, what about it made it your favorite? It's just huge. Like <laughs> it's this, uh, this huge uh, herbaceous plant that we, we happen to stumble across on one of our final days out in the field. Um, and, and they bloom very rarely. It's, it's something like once a year or something like that. And so we were really lucky to find one in bloom. And so uh, we got to, to collect it and press it. And it's just a gorgeous plant. Oh, interesting. Um, do you have any tips for pressing plants and flowers, perhaps? <laughs> um, Honestly, pressing it sooner rather than later is probably the best thing. Um, <laughs> when you're when you're pressing plants, you're you're trying to preserve as much of the plant's um, features as you can. And so, the the sooner you press it, the the better you can preserve like the color, especially. Um, that's the biggest thing I think. So sooner rather than later with the plants. <laughs> that's very interesting and really good good advice. That's good to know. Definitely. Have you any other techniques while out in the field? I know you said you were working with ornithology and mammalogy as well. Yeah, so um, we got to bird our way around uh, a lot of the sites, although our primary focus was plants. Um, so we got to see what the ornithology folks were doing with these machines called ARUs. Mm -hmm. um, and those are essentially uh, recording devices that are attached to the trees and they record some of the bird calls that we might not be able to, to experience in person. So we can track different populations and see who's where and when and how often. So that was pretty new for me. Okay, and those are called ARUs? Yeah, yeah, um, automated recording units. 
Okay, super, awesome. And um, so you mentioned the Capels fire. Did it, did it affect your research site? Definitely. Um, I can show you in this picture um, some of the other elements of the Capel site. Um, so a lot of the trees were knocked down because of the fire. Um, and since most of our sites were off the trail, um, of course, they're just left there. Nobody needs to cut them down or anything. It's actually a really great habitat for a lot of different animals. And so, um, you know, getting to the different sites and stuff, you had to get over these trees somehow um, <laughs> or go under depending on how they're positioned. Um, so the fire caused that, but uh, it also caused a lot of the vegetation to be super charred and burnt. So you can see my hands in that middle picture of how covered they are in charcoal. Um, and, and actually that gets all over you. So <laughs> as you're climbing over the trees, it just totally covers you from like head to toe and, and soot. So it definitely affected that. Um, and also once you got to the site, um, sometimes the markers that indicated exactly where to measure from, uh, those would be obscured by fallen trees, right? And so we're trying to use GPS to estimate exactly where we should be measuring from uh, because our, our markers may have been covered or, or knocked over or something. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, and who, who sets those markers? Do you all get to decide those? Yeah, so those were actually set by the U.S. Forest Service, I believe. Um, this project is with the Cal Academy and also with the Forest Service. Um, so they would, uh, this project actually started something like four or five years ago. And so they had gone and set all of these sites before the fire even happened. And so they went and they would place a rebar at one particular spot and that's where they would do their measurements based off of. And they would attach tree, track, tree tags to all of the trees around the rebar. So we'd have to go and search for those and hope they didn't get burned off by the fire or covered by some falling trees. So yeah. That sounds like an extra level of difficulty climbing over <laughs> trees, searching through the charred debris. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It was an adventure for sure. Definitely. Um, and you said you mentioned that like different animals were using these fallen trees as habitat. Did you did you get to interact with any of those animals or see them and observe them during your hikes? Totally. Um, so as I'm sure Natalie already mentioned, there was a bear encounter, um, <laughs> which wasn't super under the trees or anything because bears are kind of large. Um, but we also encountered a rattlesnake at one point that had um, made its, its home under some fallen debris, um, lots of chipmunks and squirrels and um, a couple of other snakes too. Like we saw a rubber boa and a gopher snake. Um, so all sorts of stuff, all sorts. Wow, and what did you do when you saw the rattlesnake? <laughs> oh my gosh, it was so exciting. Everyone started, um, as soon as somebody saw it, um, they yelled out, there's a rattlesnake and we heard the, the, the rattle going. Um, and so, you know, we all had to like, stay back but also I mean everyone there's a biologist and so we're all running towards the snake carefully to see it but also not disturb it so <laughs> it was exciting sounds exciting definitely oh very interesting mm -hmm. <laughs> do, you have, um, do you happen to have a favorite spot to botanize whether it be in Texas or California sure so um Coming to California, I saw so many different plants that I've never seen before. Um, but something I've always looked forward to back home, I'll show you back to the, the Texas slide, um, are the wildflowers in the spring. Um, there's this one park pretty close to my university um, called Fox Park, and there's always a ton of wildflowers in the spring. Um, it's always fun seeing the blue bonnets, especially. Um, or the, the mountain laurel trees, which they have these beautiful purple flowers and they kind of smell like grapes. So that's always my favorite <laughs> to look for in the spring. Very cool. That sounds lovely. Um, mm -hmm. Have you had a chance to botanize around San Francisco, around the Bay Area when we've gone on our little field trip excursions? <laughs> 
Um, a little bit. Um, of course, I did a lot of botanizing out in the Sierras. Um, I was there for two weeks, so it's kind of hard not to. Um, but I really enjoyed seeing the different plants um, out on the um, Costa Noa trip, um, which was all on the on the coast, kind of near Pescadero. Um, there was this one plant I really liked called ice plants, and uh, turns out it's invasive, but it was beautiful <laughs> to see. It was really cool, and it grows right on the beach, so I, I really enjoyed getting to see that. Wow! And what does it what does it look like if you can describe it for us? Um, it kind of looks like a succulent almost, um, and it has these really pretty um, pink flowers. Um, I think they can also be a couple of different colors too. Um, but I, I just thought they were gorgeous and <laughs> turns out they're invasive, so. It's always how it goes over in California. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Sure, okay. Um, and I have another question and it sure. is, do you happen to have a memory perhaps from childhood or maybe even more recent in which you realized your love for science? Yeah, so I, I've always loved science um, since I was a kid, but I remember growing up, we would go to the San Antonio Zoo um, almost every summer. And uh, my siblings and I would go and see the Komodo dragons. And we actually have pictures of us like on the Komodo dragon statues every year, uh, <laughs> which is, is really funny. Now, now I'm, I'm here and I'm doing more science stuff with animals and, and all of that, so. Definitely those trips to the zoo when I was a kid. I think that really stands out now. Oh, so fun. And and have you had a chance to see the San Francisco Zoo yet? I have. I got to go a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was it was super cool. I, I don't think we got to see the Komodo dragon, so we saw all sorts of other cool animals. <laughs> okay. Did you see, is, is there one in particular that you remember? Mm, I really enjoyed getting to see the orangutan. Uh, <laughs> the one that we saw, he was just kind of sitting on this little um, platform, just hanging out. I don't know. I thought it was fascinating. He was just sitting there, <laughs> but it was cool to see. Nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe a final question, and that might be, what is the most exciting thing you've learned this summer? It doesn't have to do with your project. It can do with um, anything you like. Oh, man. Um. Yeah, so a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> we had a, a a journal discussion and we were talking about um, ornithology drama. Um, there's been some incidences of, uh, what's the word? Like observations that maybe weren't quite um, accurate with birding. Mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of cool to talk about all of the the history behind some uh, birding observations that turned out to be false um, and, and learning all about the different birds because there's there's so much diversity in the bird world and so um, all of these sorts of things with the the birds of paradise I really enjoyed learning about. Wow oh okay yeah. <laughs> and what is you learned about the birds of paradise? I'm afraid I don't I don't know much about that species. <laughs> sure so it's a, um, it's actually a group of birds in um, and you, I'm sure you've seen them on all sorts of nature documentaries. They're always very brightly colored and have all these fancy feathers. Um, and we were talking about this uh, this guy back in like the 1800s, I think, um, who had created these like Frankenstein birds where he had taken um, parts of birds, different birds and, and put them together to like invent a species um, and was trying to pass it off as things that he had discovered out in the field. Uh, and I, I thought that was really funny because <laughs> um, I'd never heard about that happening, but um, you know, anything's possible. So it was really cool. <laughs> that is very funny. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. All right, Haley. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, we'll see everyone very shortly. We'll see everyone later on in the week on Thursday at 4 um, Pacific time. All right. See you guys later. Bye, Haley. Awesome. Bye, Bye everyone.